I think he believed in his music. I think he believed very, very strongly in his music. I think he, I don't know that he, how, what kind of success he felt. He, he had created a life for himself that worked. And that was a big effort for him. He was a, he was a fairly high, strong, somewhat neurotic character who, who needed a certain peace of mind in which to function. He had lived in the early 50s and he had moved to New York and had a nervous breakdown. He could not cope with the, the stress of urban life as it, as it was in New York and the pressures. And he spent, so he wound up spending most of his life in Aptos, in, in not that far from the city, but, but in a pleasantly countrified environment where he could have quiet, where he could think. He struggled um, with a lot of his music. I mean, I remember sitting at rehearsals of new, a couple times of new symphonies that, uh, and, and he was always wanting to, he always had to go to the rehearsals. He was always rewriting. He was always very con concerned about reworking, about what was working, what wasn't working. Um, so there, there was a certain, the certain kind of insecurity that all, I think all cre great creators have. But he also knew when he wrote something quite wonderful, and he was very proud of it. So where does he fit in terms of American composers? Um, in terms of not so much a school he might belong to, but in terms of his effect on musical conversation. Lou's position in American music is, it's hard to pinpoint in a way. He was always, he always remained kind of an outsider. There was a very brief period again in the early 50s in his New York years when Stokowski and a couple of other people got really big name performers, got interested in his work, but that was, there was very little of that. Most of his work was done outside, outside the limelight and outside the mainstream, but he was known and he was followed and, and he had acolytes. And he also taught. He taught at San Jose State. He taught at Mills College. He had people around him. People knew what he was doing. And what he was doing was also kind of outsider and kind of not. It's, he loved to call himself an outsider artist, but he wasn't an outsider artist in the sense of somebody who's untrained, who just develops a, an ability to do something interesting. Um, Lou was highly trained. He had studied with Cowell. He had studied. He had. He had. He had studied with Schoenberg, and 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 was quite admired by Schoenberg. They got along. He got along better with Schoenberg than nearly any of Schoenberg's other American pupils. Schoenberg thought very highly of Lou. Um, and Lou was always a student. He was always a student of something, either learning new techniques of Indonesian music, learning um, new ways of tuning. He was always studying something. Um, but, it was, but he created so many different kinds of things and in some ways, he was so far ahead of his time that that influence didn't necessarily filter down immediately. For example, the kinds of things he was doing, combining Western instruments and the Indonesian gamelan in the 60s, was really quite, quite new and quite revolutionary. There had been a little bit of precedent in that with, with Colin McPhee, but Lou was doing it in a radically different way. McPhee had just kind of translated, and Britain and some others had just kind of translated some Indonesian ideas of music into the Western vocabulary, as Debussy had done long before that. And Lou was actually combining these. He was actually putting two different traditions smack together and making it work and creating some really gorgeous, interesting stuff. Now today, everybody's doing that. It's the most common thing in the world to find ways of combining, you know, radically different kinds of musics. Um, Lou, was, Lou was, was a real innovator in that field and did it better than anybody is doing it today, for that matter. But how much that 
influenced, that didn't influence an immediate generation right after him, a few people. But the, the people who are doing it today, really, they, they discover Lou and they see a kindred spirit in history. But of course they got it from mixing things in iTunes or wherever they got it from. So, so Lou was there and, and important, but I actually think his, his real influence is yet to come. I think he's still to be discovered. And I think when he is, people are going to find ways to, new ways to utilize what he did. He, in that sense, he's very much like Ives. Ives, who was known in his day, who was paid attention to by a few, but whose real influence came way later when he was rediscovered in the 60s, came after his death. And then suddenly, a whole generation of people, of composers, started thinking, seeing that what Ives did could lead them into doing all kinds of interesting things with, with American music and putting together all kinds of different forms of American music in a collage. Um, so I think that's starting to happen with Lou and will happen more and more with Lou.